Hey there, it's GM Max, and we are back with part two of our little series on the Stonewall Dutch for Black. And you may recall that in the first part, we were really focusing on the main line where White is going G3 and playing this sort of setup as White as such. Uh, you know, both Knight F3 and Knight A3 setups. That's what you'll probably face the most often by some margin if you're playing this opening at master level. But if you're playing Stonewall Dutch at amateur level, then you're going to face some other systems a bit more often than G3. Uh, things such as C4 and you know, Knight C3, you're going to get this position quite a bit, uh, which we will be looking at in this uh, this part. And we'll also look at a few other bits and pieces, like what happens if they play Knight F3 and you know decide not to play C4, but to go for one of the D4, D4 specials, like bishop f4 or bishop g5 or, or e3 as it were um so that's what we'll be covering in this part and yeah if you are enjoying the series do make sure to leave a like and also consider subscribing that being said let's now get into the first game played between aronian against carlson um i forget exactly when it was played but definitely you know, good to see games by you know some of the very best players in the world and yeah carlson in this case, isn't really able to go for the stone wall so effectively, where you may recall that in part one, I mentioned that if white's able to go bishop f4 and e3 and develop like this, then it makes the stone wall a very ineffective sub for black. So the way in which we pivot here is we play to move bishop to b4 and pin the knight. And you might notice this is somewhat similar to a Nimzo Indian, where let's say if we had something like knight f6 and you know, position like this, well, it's kind of like an Imso where our pawn jumped over to, to f5 as such. It's kind of interesting to note, actually, one possible line for black in this variation is to go knight e4 and, you know, f5 and you know, go for this kind of setup like so. But you could say this is a better version because we don't have to play knight e4. You already have that very good grip over the, the e4 square, as it were. And it's definitely a very systematic approach for black where, you know, if white were to let's say, play a move like g3 and try to revert back to the setup we saw before. Uh, well, one problem that will come up is that the c4 pawn will be a bit of a weakness and we will be able to attack it by bringing our knight a5. And if they do play a move like bishop a3, we can always block it with d6 as such. So it's not really a problem. And this sort of explains why Aronian decided on the move queen to b3 in the game, because he's just making sure that the pawns aren't going to get doubled after bishop takes c3. Um, Black actually has a few different moves that he could go for at this point. Um, you know, Carlton's move of queen e7 is the, the most common one in master play. But you could also explore moves like a5 and you know, going for this kind of setup. Or even the move c5 is one that I learned was quite a good option for Black about 15 years ago is when I learned of this idea. Um, but yeah, it's not a matter of taste which one you go for. And Carlton decided to play the move queen e7, which... Probably isn't my first choice, but it's not exactly a, a mistake either. Um, you know, White can play like a3 and you know, can get the bishop pair advantage, but in the game, White decides not to go for this sort of typical Queen's Indian style play, but instead to play bishop d2 and, you know, just sort of develop the piece a bit more quietly. Uh, White played a move g3, bishop b7. And, you know, White's sort of argument is that when he castles that the bishop may end up being a little bit misplaced on b4, uh, which is why in a lot of cases you will see Black, like, recycle the bishop, like, with bishop to c3 and, you know, head towards more normal kind of territory. We can play, like, d6, knight d7, a5, e5, and sort of then play more on the on the dark squares, actually, once we, you know, have developed a knight to d7, as it were, with a, a pretty standard position for this line. Uh, but Carlton decided to be a bit more creative and play to move knight c6 and going for this idea of knight a5 and trying to grab the pawn, which probably objectively isn't the very best. Like, I think that knight c4 is maybe not so... Well, it's hard to say. Like, my first thought was there was just a mistake because of the move in the game in knight b5, but it's actually not so simple, where after knight c7 and king to f8, you know, if white does play say knight takes a8, well we do have knight takes f1 as a, as a response. So white goes knight d2 and yeah, after take, take, rook c8, we see that the pin here is a little bit annoying. Knight f3 and, and now queen d8 is a very nice move. Um, you know, we don't want to 
rush with bishop d6 because white does have knight e6 and discovering an attack on our rook as such so by playing queen d8 first we avoid that problem after rook a c1 very tricky very nice move here black of king e7 again getting out of the way of knight e6 and you know in the end i end up with this position it's basically about equal you know, black's just going to play along the this open c file and you know the piece being traded means that white's tiny space range isn't really very meaningful um and yeah the game went on for a lot more moves but in the end carlson did go on to kind of slowly outplay his opponents you know the rest of the game was admittedly not without mistakes like for example you know why not getting some tricks with d5 and making things a bit difficult for black but yeah in the end Carlson was sort of able to win the game despite a, a couple of hiccups around this point um you know probably like just rookie eight and bring the king to safety might be a bit more solid by comparison Anyway, let's move on to the next game we have here between Drev against Anatoly Weiser. And this game actually features a somewhat similar continuation to the Aronian game, where we see also in this one White playing the move of Queen to b3. Um, I suppose they could also play Bishop t2 directly and go for a3 this way, but it's not going to overly change the play. Like if they go e3, you can still go b6 and you know, just get a very normal position like bishop b7 castles and you know again just a normal plan like 94 you, know, you can always go for this in the absolute worst case scenario as a as a go-to sub for black um though it is true if white plays bishop e1 they are probably a tiny bit better with the bishop pair and you know, being able to recycle the the pieces around but still a, a pretty normal position for the line in the game, we had queen b3, and you know, rather than Aronian's bishop d2, uh, Drave decided to play to move g3, and this doesn't really allow black to play to move knight e4 and put some pressure on the knight, which shows a little bit why Aronian played bishop d2 in the earlier game. Because after bishop g2, once again, Carlton's knight c6 that it would have been kind of interesting here as well, but in the game, Weiser decides to go for uh castles castles and you know play in a very typical nimzo indian kind of style just saying that the double pawns are a bit weak that we can try to fix it and then attack it with our our pieces in a you know by bringing the knight to a5 and the bishop to a6 essentially now i do think this plan's probably not objectively the best i think that if white had played knight d2 and you know just trade off the knight and gone e4 this would just give white a very good position um you know something to keep in mind in the the Dutch defense is that this sort of structure, okay, imagining if the C3 pawns on B2, but in general, White's strategic dream in the Dutch is to get an E4 break because then he can eliminate black space and say that the E6 pawn is a bit of a long term weakness. So it's a good example of what we're trying to avoid. Whereas, yeah, in the game, I think White was still better. You know, we can kind of see that the way the game played out, White was still able to, you know, achieve this strategic dream. And, okay, Black still managed to win the game anyway, but it wasn't really because of the opening. Because here, White does have a, a pretty nice advantage with the bishop pair, the space and this kind of pressure against the uh, against the e-pawn, as it were. So, yeah, we can kind of see, you know, some different ways we can play the position. But, like I said, it's probably more precise to go knight c6 and sort of delay castling. And sort of prioritize the pressure against the c4 pawn is, is the way that I'd play it here. Um, to not give white that time to go knight d2 and e4 as it were. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much my overview of the this position after bishop b4 where... Yeah, one could go quite a bit deeper if you wanted. But it's a pretty sort of strategic line. Like you can sort of just remember the general setup and, and basically be fine. Um, now another system that you'll face quite a lot on lead chess below the 2000 level or so or you could say online level in general, is the bishop g5 pin, which I think is not particularly good, great, but it, it is certainly playable. Um, you know, even a move like h6 is kind of interesting if you, you know, just want to get rid of their bishop pair and, you know, play this sort of position. It does allow them to play e4 in some cases, though, so that's one thing to watch out for. But it is an alternative to the move bishop b4 that was played in the game, uh, where white played the move e3 and... Yeah, probably not a big fan of Williams' move of, of B6. Um, you know, of course, a lot of you will know him as you know, Ginger GM and one of the big experts and champions of the, the Dutch defense. But I think here I'd probably prefer to go H6 and, you know, if Bishop F6 then play Bishop C3 and 
you know, again, just give White these double pawns and just allowing us to sort of hit back in the center. We have some, I think, very good play for Black in this case. Uh, B6 was played instead, and yeah, in that case, I do think White gets some edge out of the opening, where you're after A3. Well, the idea of 92 we can see is that, again, White sort of avoiding the double pawns if we do take on C3. But if we play Bishop E7, it's also true that, you know, this this position is just very easy for White to play, uh, where, you know, long castles and, you know, White can even just play moves like H4, F3, Knight F4, and just have a very harmonious position in the center. And, okay, in the end, Black was able to, you know, create some chances with B5 and, you know, sack a pawn to try and get some play. And, you know, objectively speaking, it's not really enough here, but, you know, in the game, Winant was a little bit too passive. You know, F3 is probably not really, not really to go here because now Black is able to, you know, get in some good counterplay against the center, against the king on the king side. And Black was also able to use that counterplay down the B file to, you know, basically get a, a good game and, and win as such. Uh, but yeah, if White does just take the pawn, admittedly, I don't, don't really see the compensation for Black, objectively speaking. Um, you know, White can also just push in the center to deal with any queen side play. Um, so yeah, it's true this game probably isn't the best model, but still kind of shows how the positions can play out and like why we shouldn't just play the Queens Indian sap without really thinking about the position more deeply. As for the other game between Rezilch against uh, Yusupov, um, this game features the same first five moves, but this time White plays the move of Bishop H4 instead of the Bishop F6 that we analyzed before. And I quite like Yusupov's approach of c5, like just playing in the Nimzo style and, you know, preparing to have that c4 pawn fixed as a weakness when we do end up taking on c3. Much like in the previous game, it might have been better for White to go knight e2 and just sort of defend the, the knight against in this way, you know, so that pawns don't get doubled. I think Black should still be doing fine here, like knight e4 castles and, you know, you can still go for like knight c6 or d6 and... Yeah, you definitely get some play here, but you know, White can also play this position, of course, with some pretty natural developing moves. But in the game, White played a3, which I think is a move that Black is fairly happy to see here. Uh, you know, after knight c6 and castles, we're just in a, a really good position to play in the center or, you know, indeed to put pressure on the c4 pawn. Our structure is definitely a lot more flexible and we can kind of see that, you know, the bishop on h4 is a little bit offside. Um, so I think this is maybe why White was feeling a little bit uncomfortable, but probably she should just play a move like F3, just so she can kind of tuck away the bishop if it gets attacked. But White played G4 instead, which I think is a little bit too ambitious. Like, I think if Black just takes the pawn, I don't really see the compensation. Like, I'm guessing the idea is she wants to play Rook G1, but yeah, you're not really getting the pawn back, and it's not that easy to, you know, actually open up the floodgates to the Black King, despite the supposed weakening of g5. Um, in the game, Yusupov played g5 and then knight g4, trying to keep a bit more control as such. Um, and to be fair, black probably is still better in this position, but maybe not by as much as the, the fg4 line. But yeah, I guess around this point, maybe the game loses a little bit of relevance to me, because after knight a5, black is just really dominating. Like, if you go rook g4, just bishop f3 is completely shutting out everything on the king side and just giving black full control. The plan is just going to be play rook c8 and basically pile on the weakness on c4, which white is a little bit hard pressed to defend in the long term. So for me, yeah, the game is very one-sided and I think we have kind of seen enough in, in a sense to, you know, realize our king is not going to be coming under, under fire in a sense when they try this sort of thing. It's just a little bit suicidal. Uh, okay, let's see some other games. You know, this kind of, wraps up I want to share with like the alternatives with c4 uh, as it were you know where they don't just play g3 um, but let's see a, a few other options uh, actually before I move on I will point out that you know white does have a few other approaches like you know moves like e3 and a3 and you know in f3 like these moves do exist but yeah I'm not sure how often you're really going to face them like you know if e3 you can still you know go back to the sort of stonewall sap we've kind of seen before and you know, if they do play a3, yeah, it stops the move bishop b4, but, you know, you could still play, like, bishop e7 and still go back to a Ilyan Janevsky setup where, you know, a3 is a little bit useless, let's say. And if they do play f3, there's, like, a few decent responses, but, again, going fd5, 
does make some sense. Like F3 doesn't really gel that well with, with white setup with, you know, Knight F3 not really being available, but anyway, it's a little bit of a digression. Let's uh, move on to some of the, some of the later games, just start refreshing my memory for, but yeah, this was, was the next one I wanted to show. So this was a game between a uh, sugar of a quite strong Russian GM now representing Hungary playing as white against Evgeny Glyserov, one of the, you know, experts of the, the E6 Dutch systems and the, the Stonewall. And yeah, we see in this game white going for the, uh, for the London system, which I think is one of the better options for white against the Dutch. Like if white plays correctly, they should get a little bit of an edge. Uh, I mean, you could also play B6, you, know, you can also play this move order, kind of hoping that they play C4 a bit early and you know, kind of allow you to put the bishop on B4 in in some cases, but if they do play a move like say h3 and go for this move order, yeah, you're just going to be kind of committed to bishop e7 in any case. Um, I do remember there is actually one kind of interesting setup that the black can play here, which I'm not sure to say like particularly great from a computer point of view, but I sort of remember this idea I saw a while back where you can sort of play like queen e7 and basically go knight c6, e5 or h6 and g5 and yeah, objectively speaking, it's probably not the, the best option, but it's, yeah, it's not so bad necessarily, like just going for, you know, more of a Leningrad Dutch style setup, but it's something I'll leave for you to, uh, to explore in your own time if you are, if you are so inclined. Um, but anyway, let's see how the game played out with bishop to e7, h3, castles, bishop d3, b6, and here a normal approach would just be to play castles, bishop e7, c4, and you know, white has a small but fairly pleasant advantage like if they go we go 94 which is kind of the standard move because like d6 i have to watch out for the the e6 pawn being a bit weak uh you know something like uh like this is sort of a good example of a trap that i've caught out quite a few players with when playing as white so definitely something you want to avoid as black and you know one reason why you often see a knight move to a6 instead in these positions but yeah knight fd2 is a good reply and you know, I have to admit that white is it's just going to be fairly comfortably better in a, in a position like this. Uh, you know, that's merely the risk that you sort of take when you, when you play a sideline, if they play the right moves, they will get a, a little bit of an advantage, but still, of course, a very playable position for black here. Um, it's like the computer kind of gives a very weird idea of playing like Bishop H4 and, you know, clearing the way for knight of six and 94, but okay. That's a little bit weird. Even for, for me, I would get say, but instead of playing normally and just having a small positional advantage, White went for this move at g4, which is actually, I think, practically quite a tricky move. And yeah, it's a move I also faced in a similar position online where I had some problems dealing with it as black. The best option probably is to go knight d5 and sort of pressure the bishop in this kind of way. But in the game, black side to go bishop b7, let white take, and, and then play knight d5. So very similar idea using some tactics to our advantage where if white does start gobbling pawns, you know, we're going to get some pretty decent play in the style of the English defense, actually, where we get a lot of pressure down the long diagonal and, you know, here the move like D6 is certainly not bad, but even some intermezzos like Queen F8 are, you know, asking some tricky questions of white here. Um, so that's kind of a, a nice approach at our disposal. In the game, white played Bishop H2 and that before again, quite a nice move, sort of not just taking pawn back automatically, but really trying to disrupt white's setup. Uh, the game went bishop e2, and from this point, the game maybe loses a bit of its relevance, because I think rook f5 is a bit of a mistake. Like, why can just go c3, kick our knight back, and yeah, I think that, you know, a position like this is is just really bad for black. Like, white just has a very easy attack down the g file, and, you know, it's very hard for our, our knights to really coordinate in the best way, let's say. So if you're going to make this work as black, you do need to play to move bishop e4. Um, bit of a creative move, but yeah, kind of nice to at least prompt a move like knight a3 before playing rook f5. Because now the difference is if they play c3, like you can you know, even play queen f8 and you don't have knight d2 anymore to, to defend their knight on, uh, on f3 as it were. But if they play a move like knight c3, yeah, it is true. They also, you know, are sacrificing a pawn and yeah, this is maybe a little bit of a tangent, but... You know, white gets good compensation, but you know, we don't have any real weaknesses and are reasonably well-placed to, to deal with the attack on the G-file, let's say. 
but Sir Bishop is blocking it after all. Anyway, let's move on to, to some other games, some that may be a little more instructive. This one is by another old school expert of the um, of the Dutch in Vladimir Milanjuk, playing black against Dragon Vasilievich. I really think Milanjuk tends to have more played the you know the Leningrad Dutch a lot more than the E6 systems, but against the London he does decide to go for E6 and you know head to similar territory to what we saw in the in the previous game actually, where you know we kind of saw these moves before and you know, knight E4, knight F D2. Um, here Milanjuk decided not to play knight D2 as I I suggested in the previous game. But he went for the move knight g5, just trying to keep a bit more tension and say the knights are a little bit stuck. That being said, I do think that white is better in this position as well. But the plan he went for of b4 and going c5 is maybe not, wouldn't be my top choice. Um, like I think a move like d5 maybe is a little bit more unpleasant. Because um, then you sort of get this king's Indian type of structure where the black bishop would much rather be on this diagonal and the bishop on h is a really good defender against the attack. And... You know, White also has moves like F4 to kind of fight back as well. This is sort of why I'm not maybe super enthusiastic about this position, even though, you know, it is still playable. But I mean, White should have a little something, I think, at, at this point. But after B4, Knight D7, I think, yeah, again, probably White should be thinking about trying to, like, get some some play going on the queen side, maybe in this sort of way. Though if they do play A4, I guess we do have moves like E5 or A5 available to, to try and stymie their play a bit. Um, like, for example, I play b5, we're sort of <clears throat> making to lock up the queen side where we have, you know, some more practical chances on the, the king side then. But in the game, I played c5, and I think that in this case, I don't really see anything particularly wrong with just taking and, you know, just grabbing the pawn in a sense. Um, you know, White still has compensation, but it's not like they're really better at this point. Um, the move in the game, knight f7, is I think a little bit too passive, where I think the rising position is... Which is very pleasant for white. Um, you know, a move like queen b3 is making it a little bit difficult to defend the pawn on uh, on e6. Because if we have to play a move like d5, you know, we're just giving white a, a kind of a dream position against the stone wall with the bishop on f4. Instead, white played bishop f3, and yeah, the game maybe loses a little bit of its relevance for me from here. Where I think black, instead of playing d5, which left him in a worse position, although he still managed to win it anyway, but... I think correct here is just to take and, you know, just play like g5 and getting in a position like this, black has pretty decent play where you can just play on the, on the light squares and, and that should avoid, you know, any major problems just playing on the c file and yeah, just using our space on the king side in a sense. Anyhow, moving on to some other games, let's see the next one being Aronian against Grishuk. Um, and that also concludes our coverage of the London where, yeah, like I said, the London system is probably one reason why I wouldn't play like the Stonewall in literally every single game. Because yeah, this I think is just as good objectively as as the move G3 for White. Um, and probably easier to play as well. But anyway, that's sort of the case. Like whatever opening you play, especially the sidelines, is going to be at least one system that's a bit annoying to deal with. Um, so Bishop G5 was the way Aronian played it against Grishuk and... Yeah, for this one, you know, if you really want to play a Stonewall, you can play d5, but again, not really ideal to go for it when that bishop is outside the pawn chain. Um, so yeah, I think the way Aronian, the way that Grishuk played it with bishop e7 is is going to be better here. And in the game, white played quite directly, going bishop f6. <clears throat> bishop f6 and now to move e4, just trying to grab that space in the center. And interestingly enough, we don't really take on e4 here, because it kind of helps white to get a big lead in development. Um, in fact, this position also often arises from the uh, from the two knight c3 anti dutch that we'll likely see in part three, because um, I don't think we'll get to it in this part without the video being way too long. But yeah, after e4 instead, Grishok just plays d5, saying that if white does play a move like e5 at this point, that we can just play bishop e7, and then we get this sort of French type structure where you know we're just gonna play for the move c5 here. Um if they try to stop with knight b3, we just prepare it with knight d7. And yeah, white's probably got a small edge because of the the extra space, but we do have the bishop pair, and I think we have very good practical chances. And you know, it's a position where the better player is going to win. So and it's sort of a given, you know, when you play the Dutch, you're not really playing for equality, but more to get the maximum fighting chance and imbalance, which we definitely succeed in doing here. 
Um, you know, even when they play EF5, as, as it happened in the game, like this position is still got that imbalance of, you know, the bishop pair and the, you know, the slight asymmetry of the F5 pawn. Um, but this one, I actually kind of like the move of queen e2. Like, I think this would ask a few questions and you know, I do think getting her an endgame is probably in white's best interest here. Um, it allows them to more easily use the weakness on e5. Um, but still, black should probably be doing okay even here, well, you could say. Why went bishop d3 instead? You know, now it was black's turn to flick in the queen e7. Um, you know, saying if queen e2, you know, can even play like knight c6 and... You know, they kind of have to play a slightly awkward recapture either way as such uh, compared to playing bishop f1 takes e2 in the other line. So this is probably why Aronian went bishop e2 in the game. But I think that the rising position is just fine for black. Um, you know, bishop e6 is maybe not the most precise. Uh, you know, the engine really likes ideas of going g5 and just really getting a lot of active play on the king side, just grabbing the space. Because by kicking knight, we also make it harder for him to get a knight e5 in the future, which is a... Uh, a nice little point. In the actual game, bishop b6 was, yeah, not the most precise, I think, because the bishop can be a little bit awkward in some cases, and, you know, to move c4 by Ronin is just very nice, realizing that black is, you know, not in a position to saddle white with an IQP. After queen f7, queen to b3, um, black played rook a to, to b8, um, which maybe is a little bit passive here, you know, move like c5 would actually be very interesting when you end up sacking the pawn, but you're getting some nice play and kind of forcing open the position for your bishops, as it were. In the game, black kind of got something similar, because, yeah, white, you know, probably in retrospect should put the queen on c2 and you know, try to set up these kind of threats to grab a pawn if, if black is not alert. But after a4, yeah, now c5 is just, you now in an even better version, because we're not even sacking a pawn and we're just getting that long diagonal open for the bishop. Uh, it's a good example of what white's trying to avoid in this bishop g5 takes f6 torre line. And takes here yeah, also kind of helps black, I think, to to develop the knight more actively. So we can sort of see that, you know, Grisha has sort of outplayed his opponent a little bit in this middle game. Uh, where after takes, takes, black is... It's just doing very, very well. And, you know, the game went on for quite a while, so I think we can sort of stop here and, you know, say black is just clearly better with the bishop pair advantage. Um, so yeah, let's move on to, to the next game that was played between Topalov against Ivanchuk, and it features a slightly different setup by Black, where, you know, White decides not to play Bishop F6 immediately, but to prepare it with the move C3 first, being a little bit more flexible. In this case, I think Ivanchuk's B6 is maybe not the absolutely most precise, where I probably would prefer to play either a move like D5 and, you know, saying that this version of the the Stonewall is not as bad when they need an extra tempo to play c4 later. Or you can just play castles and kind of get similar play, like if they take an e4. You're getting very similar play here to what we saw in the in the previous game. Where again, something like this is definitely not going to be not going to be an issue for Black to put it mildly. Um even in the middle game, sometimes you can even go g5, g4, and you know, try to get play on this side. But yeah, maybe an optimistic to do it before you've got your other pieces developed. But anyway, b6 was played, which you know, does allow white to get an e4 in a slightly better version compared to what we saw before. You know, I think that this position is very nice for white, and I really like Topalov's move of h4 here just to create weaknesses on the queen side. And yeah, even though Ivanchuk did go on to win this game, I think that this position here is quite significantly better for white, where the move bishop a6 is sort of the right idea to trade off the bishop pair, but I think that Licking e5 first and then bishop a6 would have just given white a very big advantage. Um, the way the game played out, white might have been a little bit too optimistic with some of his moves. Like, for example, here I think that rook hg1, yeah, very dynamic, but not really necessary to sack the pawn when, you know, when e5 is just giving such a strong grip over the position and in the center. Because um, also in a position like this, we can kind of see, you know, that if d6 is played, that, you know, the pawn e6 is also then going to become a weakness as such. After rook h1, yeah, it just sort of allows black to, you know, sort of grab the pawn and, okay, probably objectively it shouldn't have worked, but, you know, it did end up working in the game where, you know, in the end, Ivanchuk was sort of able to navigate the complications better than, than Topalov, uh, where in this position was sort of the, the key moment where if white finds us moving knight d4 with the idea of going knight b5, it's, it's very, very tough for black to save this, but... 
it's not after d6 black was suddenly doing more or less fine and you know after bishop g5 this pin is uh a little bit annoying um you know white was counting on queen a5 and trying to you know get into it this way but Ivanchuk found a great counter in the move rook takes d2 uh with the point that you can't really take because then there's you know takes and and black plays this intermezzo of queen d6 before taking the queen uh to avoid the knight c6 fork so white played knight c6 immediately but you know here white basically had to flick in the move queen a7 and then rook d2 and you know, then the position is very unclear but you know one where white is basically going to be holding because black's king is at least as exposed as white's king here uh but after rook d2 instead yeah it was just game over after king d2 queen g5 the the white queen is lost on the next move and, and therefore to pile of resigned having seen this let's now look at some other games as well where i think that this game between Geertz against Ullabin is yeah it's going to be the the last game we'll look at for this uh for this study as such or for this uh this part uh we're going to save some of the the anti-dutch lines like knight c3 bishop f4 e4 bishop g5 we'll be looking at those in uh, in part three instead uh just so that you know each video is of a, a reasonable length for you guys um so the game went e6 e3 and yeah we see white going for this uh you know this collet style setup as white um as i mentioned before if they go c4 you can just play b6 and you know, play it in the in the spirit of the queen's indian with f5 already being played so end up playing bishop d3 and yeah we end up getting this this position you know in the uh in the spirit of the you know the stone wall as such with white playing bishop d3 and yeah after b3 it makes sense that white wants to play bishop a3 and trade off our uh, our bishop so we play the move queen e7 e7 to circumvent that again if white plays move like a4 to trade the bishops it comes at the price that you know the b4 square does become a bit of a weakness in the middle game and i think that black's position is reasonably flexible where you know the engines are giving white a tiny edge but i don't really consider it to be anything serious like you just have very natural play in in such a position um so instead white plays bishop to b2 um and here white does have a little bit of a choice of how to play it where you know the move in the game of queen c1 to kind of insist on bishop a3 is is definitely quite harmonious here um you could also play a move like knight c3 and you know just play for a a setup like knight e5 and bring the knight around to e2 which i think this is definitely quite an unpleasant setup and you know, it's why i've actually recommended for white in the past where you know i don't really have a a miracle weapon here i think that after say 94 92 like 97 you know white is just better here like they're going to kick our knight away of f3 and there's sadly not a whole lot we can really do about it at uh, at this point um so this is sort of one reason why i kind of mentioned the approach of like going for like b6 instead because i think it's objectively a little bit better than the than the approach with uh with d5 but yeah if you want to insist on the stone wall you can play it it just comes with this let's say disclaimer that white is going to be better in this position i suppose maybe the best try is to go bishop d7 and like try to you know maneuver the bishop around this way and try to recycle it for one of the knights but once again i do think white is a little bit better in in this position once more uh like it's, it's a very harmonious setup when you when you get something like this on the board but okay you can play c5 and like it's it's reasonably playable at the very least where you'll get some some play in the center to work with as such anyway the game saw queen c1 and there are a few approaches that you can take at this point but i do kind of like the one that black played from sort of a practical point of view um there are some moves like a5 if you want to try and disrupt white this way but yeah after b6 the idea of this is not just to fianchetto our bishop but also in fact to play c5 and basically avoid the exchange of the dark squared bishops that you know would definitely be in white's favor in general um, I think the way that White played it with Bishop Knight C3, um, I think I might have got to introduce the players. This was a game between Geertz against Ullabin. Um, but Knight C3, I think, is maybe not the most precise. You know, probably White should just take and like Knight D5 and, you know, just sort of saddle Black with this, uh, with this isolated pawn. And, you know, White is slightly better because of this weakness, but it's a position that's reasonably solid. I can go Bishop B7. You know the knight can come to b6 and you know i think it's it's reasonably playable let's say um but yeah obviously white's gonna be pretty happy as well whereas after knight c3 i think that you know the way that was playing the game with dc4 was 
yeah, not really ideal. Like, I think this is just a very pleasant position for White. You could definitely say it's a better version compared to the the one we saw where we were taking and our knight was getting active. Now, because we took first there, Bishop is the one who got more active. So I do feel like the game loses a little bit of its relevance from this point because you know, after Rook D1 and, you know, just sort of playing natural moves, White is just going to be much better here. And, you know, Black won more because he's a stronger player than, you know, because his opening play was any good. However, we can improve on Black's play pretty easily. I think if you go Bishop A6 and then DC4, there's going to be a much better version of Ullipin's idea where we can, you know, take and, you know, now Bishop C4 are able to take and, you know, it's a much better version now when, you know, they don't have the Bishop active on this diagonal. We also have the plan of putting some pressure on the, the A C4 pawn with our Rook and Knight. Um, so I think the Black's more or less doing fine. There's, there's nothing really to worry about here. So that's pretty much, yeah, what I wanted to share in terms of this part two, just making sure that, you know, you're ready for the systems where they play like, you know, D4 and C4 or Knight F3, but then don't play the G3 setup, but go for a different one, like the Knight C3 setups or like C4, Knight C3, or indeed the D pawn specials like Bishop F4, Bishop G5 or E3. In any case, you're now ready to deal with these, and, you know, we've already mentioned before, but yeah, in some lines, why it's getting a little bit of an advantage with best play. But we do get an interesting position with some counter-attacking chances in every case. So it's something where, you know, if we're the stronger player, we have a very good chance of, of winning the game. Especially given that we are, you know, because we've gone through so many games here, we're very likely to understand the positions and be more familiar with them than our, our opponents as such. So yeah, that's all for, for this training. Um, you know, Do let me know in the comments below what was the main takeaway or the, the biggest insight that you've got from, you know, this series. Um, and yeah, if you are interested in having private lessons with me, I do have a, a few coaching spots still left. So yeah, feel free to message me you know, on Facebook or by email. I've put the links to do that in the description below. Um, and yeah, I'll see you guys in part three of the training where we are going to wrap things up with the, uh, you know, with the courage of the anti-Dutch systems, like Knight C3, Bishop F4, Bishop G5 and the Staunton Gambit with E4. Uh, so yeah, I'll see you there.